Thank you so much, Ruth Ellen. Good morning. We're glad to welcome you to our worship service today. We hope that you will experience the presence of God as we spend these next moments together. Uh, this is the uh, first Sunday that we'll be gathering back in the sanctuary at uh, 930 uh, each Sunday. Uh, so that will give us a couple of more options uh, for you want to start over. Can you start this over? <laughs> Good morning. Thank you so much, uh, Ruth Ellen, for that uh, wonderful music this day. So pleased that you have chosen to join with us here as we uh, gather for these next moments of worship. Uh, this is the first Sunday that we'll be gathering at 930 inside our sanctuary. Of course, you'll still have the option to drive up and listen in the car uh, on the radio if you would like, or you are wel welcome to come on Wednesday evenings when we actually tape uh, the service that goes out uh, on YouTube. Uh, you're welcome to come and be a part of that time as well. Uh, so you'll have uh, several more opportunities to come and be a part of our worship here at Chadburn Baptist Church. Let's begin with uh, the uh, word of scripture. Psalm 139 verses 1 through 12, then verses 23 and 24. Psalm 139, 1 through 12, 23 and 24. You have searched me, Lord, and you know me. You know when I sit down and when I rise up. You perceive my thoughts from afar. You discern my going out and my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. Before a word is on my tongue, you, Lord, know it completely. You hem me in behind and before. You lay your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn and if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me and the light become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there is any offensive way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. May the Lord bless to our hearts and minds this portion of the written word today. Let's bow for our opening prayer. Holy God of might and power, as we gather here this day in your presence, we pray, Lord, that you would pour out your strength and power on us as your children, that you would feed our souls the nourishment that we need to allow our souls to grow. May your presence fill our lives and lead us to be your people, your children, equipped to do your work in this world that you love so much. Through Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. This morning, as we sing our hymn, uh, I've selected a song that uh, is not in our current hymnal, I'm, I'm sorry to say, but it is one that I feel that all of us uh, know. It is entitled, My Lord is Near Me All the Time. Isn't that a wonderful thought? Uh, let us sing all three verses of this hymn together.
you so much, today for leading us in that hymn this morning. We have that time set aside now where we go to our uh, spend a few moments with our children. So we hope that uh, you'll have the opportunity to pay uh, just a little closer attention in just the next few moments uh, for our children who are out there. Uh, today we're telling a story that's very, very familiar. Uh, it's the story when Jesus was out teaching, uh, sort of out in a, a place that was away out in the country. Uh, there were no stores, there were no restaurants, and after he had been teaching all day, uh, the people were starting to get hungry as it was starting to get dark. Uh, and so uh, his disciples came to Jesus and said, hey, you know, you need to uh, let, let the crowd go so they can go back to their homes and they won't be hungry. Uh, there's so many of them that are out here. And, of course, uh, we know what happened that Jesus said, you need to feed them. Uh, they went out and they found a small boy who had just a little little lunch his mom had probably packed for him before he took off for that day. Uh, it was uh, uh, five little loaves and a couple of small fish, and uh, they brought them to Jesus, and Jesus blessed it, and they passed it out. And everybody that was there not only had just a bite or two to eat, they were all filled. They were full. And then there were 12 baskets of food left over. A tremendous, tremendous miracle. But you know, in our world today, uh, we have a lot of folks that are hungry, and a lot of times we sort of feel like the disciples. The disciples went to Jesus and said, we don't, have, we don't have money to go out and buy uh, food for 5,000 people. Uh, we, we, what, what can we do? And Jesus said, uh, you, you do it. You take care of it. And they went and they found this young boy, not much, but brought it and gave it to Jesus, and Jesus blessed it, and everyone was completely filled. And what I've got here in my hands is my little change that I pulled out of my pocket, so you can't see it, uh, but I've got a couple of quarters and three pennies, a nickel and a dime. So I've got a, a pretty good little bit of change right here in my pocket, a little bit more than I usually carry. But you know, that's not really a whole lot of money, is it? Uh, in fact, you probably couldn't even buy an ice cream cone for uh, whatever that amount turns out to be, about uh, 68 cents. Uh, that's not much at all. But you know what? If I give my 68 cents and everybody around, all of you children and maybe your parents and other folks bring in their little bit of money and we put it all together with people not only here in our church but in other churches all around the world, we put all of that money together and we can go and take that money and feed somebody in another country. Uh, that doesn't have enough food to eat simply because we're willing to come together and let God use the things that he has blessed us with to help those in need. And that's kind of like what the little boy did. He was willing to give up his lunch. He was probably hungry too, just like everybody else, but he was willing to give up his lunch and give it to Jesus. He didn't have any idea what Jesus was going to do with it. Maybe he thought Jesus was just going to eat all his food and he wouldn't be hungry anymore and everybody else would be hungry. But we know that's not the way Jesus is, is it? Jesus is compassionate. And Jesus took that small amount and he used it and he blessed it and everyone was filled. And in fact, this miracle that Jesus performed was one of the most popular miracles that Jesus ever performed. If you go and look in the New Testament in all four of the Gospels, it not only appears in every one, Matthew tells the story about him feeding a large number of people twice, as does Mark. Uh, so six times in the New Testament, it talks about Jesus feeding a large multitude of people with just a handful of food because they, folks were willing to bring the things to Jesus and Jesus blessed them and multiplied them. That's an exciting thing to think that we can be a part of, of doing what God does, doing what Jesus did with just a, a little bit of things that God's given us to put in our hands. So let's pray and thank God that he gives us the ability to help and that he is the one who is able to truly help. Lord, we do thank you so much for your great love. We thank you that you do not want anyone to be hungry or in need. And Lord, we pray that you would help us as we seek to be uh, 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 your partners in helping those who are in need, not only around us, but literally around the world. And we offer this prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you, Brother David. We come now to a time of sharing our prayer needs. And since the last time, uh, you might have tuned in on YouTube. Uh, there are some updates and uh, one or two new things that I'd like to share with you. 
Uh, Katie Ketchum, this is uh, Bruce and Miranda's youngest. She had a minor eye procedure this past Wednesday at Southern Pines, and uh, Brother Bruce told me that she came through A-OK, -okay, so we're very happy about that praise report. Uh, Jerome and Elaine Honeycutt's grandson, Preston Bennett, uh, had an outpatient procedure done last week in Wilmington, and all went well. So he is home now and healing and getting strong, and we are also glad for this praise report as well. Dr. Sharon Edwards continues to uh, ask for your prayers in regards to the vision of her right eye and that it will uh, heal and try to get back to normal the way she'd like for it to be. Uh, we want to continue to remember the family of George Walker. This was Myrtle Walker's brother-in-law and Brother Herman's older brother. And finally, to please continue to keep my cousin Wanda Stidger in your prayers. She is in the hospital in Fort Worth, Texas. And uh, she has AML leukemia uh, with a, a blood cancer. Uh, it, we're praying for a miracle. God is still in the miracle business. And uh, so the family requests your prayers in this matter, and so do I. We have a lot of things that we could bring to God's feet. And God hears them all, and he answers them in his own way. Let us pause right now and go to him in prayer. Lord, from, ever, from wherever we are tuning in, we may be watching this with a need on our heart, something heavy on our minds. And as we pause, perhaps we will share what it is with you. Yes, we, we're aware that you already know what it is, but it's okay. You want us to come right out and, and share what is on our heart. Lord, we ask that you hear these requests. Take them to yourself. Answer them in your own way. We may not understand or maybe even particularly like how they are answered, but help us to remember first and foremost that we want our will to be in accordance with your will. Thank you for your nearness. Thank you for your mercy, your grace, and your love. I ask a blessing upon those bringing our special music, as well as to your servant, who will bring the word in just a few minutes. These things we ask in your name. Amen. Well, I'm so glad that uh, people have picked up the gauntlet that I have thrown down when it comes to helping me out of a jam, uh, when it comes to special music. Last week, Brother Chris Yates sang, and uh, I'm delighted that this morning uh, our praise team has come, and if there's anything that they would like to say prior to the uh, song, I'll, I'll let them say something. Uh, so, yes, you can if you want. I mean, there's some microphones right out here. So welcome them in your heart as they come and share a message that God has laid upon their hearts. Thank you, Dave, <clears throat> for twisting my arm because yeah. you know I despise getting up and speaking in front of people, right? <laughs> no, it, it is a blessing to be here this morning. And, um, you know, you talk about being fed and how Jesus feeds us. I think that this is one of his main avenues is coming together as Christians and worshiping in his name. And it's been hard to get fed lately. A lot of us are having to do our online services and our drive ups and we're missing that bond that we get between fellow Christians. And um, it, it was just awesome that you asked us to come and sing because we love being together and, and this feeds us as much as it, you know, hopefully God is using us to feed others as well. So we love you all.
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you so much for that wonderful special music today. We certainly appreciate all that it adds to our worship. Our scripture text for today, uh, said, let me don't forget to take the offering. <laughs> we uh, forgot it last week. I forgot to mention that, but uh, we will be uh, receiving the offering. We certainly appreciate all who have been uh, faithful in sending them in in the mail, and uh, we will uh, acknowledge that at this time. And let's uh, have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, again, we are quick to acknowledge that all we have comes as a gift from your hand. And Lord, what we return to you is really simply returning to you what already belongs to you. And Lord, we pray that as we practice good stewardship, uh, that we would receive your blessing and that you would use these gifts uh, to bless those around us in this world. And we offer this prayer in the name of Christ. Amen. Our scripture text this morning comes from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 14, verses 13 through 21. Matthew 14, 13 through 21. Hear the reading of God's written word. When Jesus heard what happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds followed him on foot from the towns. When Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. As evening approached, the disciples came to him and said, This is a remote place and it's already getting late. Send the crowds away so that they can go to the villages and buy themselves some food. Jesus replied, They do not need to go away. You give them something to eat. We have here only five loaves of bread and two fish, they answered. Bring them here to me. And he directed the people to sit down on the grass, taking the five loaves and two fish and looking up to heaven. He gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples and the disciples gave them to the people. They all ate and were satisfied. And the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. The number of those who ate was about 5,000 men besides women and children. May the Lord bless to our hearts and to our minds this portion of the written word today. Dr. Pop, uh, Dr. Parker Palmer was en route to a conference uh, when the plane he was on uh, had an unexpectedly long layover at the airport. The truck that was supposed to deliver the refreshments for the next leg of the journey had broken down. And finally, the pilot decided that it was better to uh, get everybody to their destination, uh, even if they did not have snacks to eat on the flight. So he told everyone, and he got on the, got, uh, on the intercom, and then got up in the air. And as soon as they were in the air, as you can imagine, the pa passengers all started grumbling. You could hear one say, well, a ticket is a contract, and snacks are a part of that contract. I ought to sue, muttered another one. A man stood up and said, I'm a lawyer. How many are willing to join in a class action suit? There was a minor mutiny getting ready to start right there in the airplane. But something interesting happened, Dr. Palmer tells. Uh, a flight attendant came on the public address system, and she began with the very familiar information on the flights that you always get that almost everybody ignores. Ladies and gentlemen, the captain has turned off the seatbelt lights. Now we have attained a cruising altitude of 30,000 feet. But she continued and said something quite, quite extraordinary. Having served many of you on the first leg of this flight, I know some of you still have your bags of peanuts which you put in your pocket. How many do we have? Five? Please open them and share with the people around you. I'm sure some of you have mints. Would you share these around also? Those of you who got newspapers, you can only read one section at a time. Now why don't you spread out the other sections around for others to read? Some of you are grandparents or parents. Take out the pictures of your children or grandchildren and show them to those that are beside you. And with that brief announcement, she changed the entire emotional climate of the flight. 
Later, when she came near Parker Palmer's seat, he asked her, young lady, what is your name and what is the name of your supervisor? I want to write a letter of commendation. That was the best example of group leadership I have ever seen. To which she replied simply, the loaves and the fishes still work. And with that, she smiled and went on her way. Of course, we know what she was referring to. In fact, we know that there are many scholars who believe this was exactly what happened when Jesus fed the great multitude with only small, uh, five small pieces of bread and two small fish, that uh, when people saw the young boy willing to share his lunch, they all pulled out the food that they had brought with them and began sharing. Uh, but uh, that may or may not be what happened. That's not how the story is told. But we do know that there was an enormous crowd of people. They followed Jesus out in the wilderness because of some deep need that they had. In fact, we know that there were many who were sick because Jesus healed them. Uh, we don't know how if Jesus was teaching or if he was simply spending the day with people, hearing their problems and trying to help them in a way that only Jesus could. But it had been a long day. Day after a long night and the disciples are kind of trying to scope out the situation and they said listen these folks are going to be hungry in a little bit we need to get them on their way and of course Jesus says uh, no you need to you need to take care of their needs and you can imagine how surprised the disciples were when he said that in fact they probably thought to themselves if they didn't voice it that's absolutely absurd we don't even have enough food for us here much less these 5,000 people plus the women and the children that are here and then in fact some of the folks uh, uh, had, the disciples had already sort of scoped out the problem and found that the only people they could see was one little boy who had five little five little loaves as well as two fish and we need to understand what's described there in the new testament five barley loaves is not the same as having five loaves of big fresh bread i mean there again this was just a little boy uh, he wasn't gonna be walking around carrying five big loaves of, of bread and the fish it wasn't like he had uh, two big slabs of salmon uh, that, that he was carrying around with him. It's just something he could kind of put in your pocket. It's really a small, like little sandwich rolls, almost like crackers. And of course, they would have been very dry to eat. And so mom put in two little fish, probably little tiny fish about the size of, of a sardine. Uh, and they were there not to give a whole lot of protein. They were there to help him choke down those dry barley loaves that he had, uh, kind of like a relish. So uh, it, it really was just sort of a snack. It really wasn't a full-blown meal. And that just adds to uh, the, uh, the, the gravity of the great thing that Jesus did, just tiny little rolls of, uh, of, of bread uh, and two tiny fish put into the master's hand, everyone didn't just get a bite. They all got full. They were stuffed to the brim to the point where when they collected what was left over, there were 12 baskets of food left over. You know, this is uh, an amazing miracle as I shared with our children there uh, a few moments ago. Uh, in the first century, most people went around most of the time hungry. It was difficult to find food. It was difficult to provide a lot of food. And in fact, to have more than enough food to eat was an occurrence that probably only happened at a celebration like a wedding, uh, a great feast that was looked forward to. But here, Jesus out in the wilderness, uh, performing this, uh, this feat where everybody got more than they could possibly eat and they had food left over was something that was astounding, absolutely astounding. And that's why uh, the story or, uh, is told at least six times in the Gospels, if it's just referring to the same one, or maybe there were multiple occasions when Jesus did this, uh, as, uh, as Luke's Gospel seems to uh, talk about the feeding of 4,000 rather than 5,000. But whatever it was, Jesus met the needs, more than met the needs of all the people 
that came out into the wilderness to look for him. And how he did it, we don't really know, but we do know that he did. And there are three truths, I think, in this episode that, that show us more about who Jesus is. The first uh, thing, that it, truth that it shows us is compassion. Secondly, it shows us Jesus' competence. But third, it also shows our role of being compliant in God's plan. But first, this event reveals the compassion of Christ. In fact, that's the first thing we read in this story. Jesus sees a large crowd of people, and he had compassion on them. Now, this doesn't catch us off guard. Uh, We understand that Jesus came with one purpose, a desire to seek and to save the lost. When he gazed out over Jerusalem, he wept with compassion because he knew the heartaches and the headaches and the difficulties, the hungers that go with being a human being, and yet he still has compassion for us. He weeps over the plight of his people. He has compassion because he's been where we are. He was doubted and denied and betrayed and broken in his body. And so when we hurt and we go to him, we know he understands because he has been where we are too. He has hurt like we hurt as well. Some of you that are college football fans like I am know the name Joe Burrow. Burrow Burrow led his team, the LSU Tigers, to last year's national championship football game, and he also won the 2019 Heisman Trophy as the nation's most outstanding football player. And what's interesting about it is at the ceremony where he accepted the Heisman Trophy there uh, with all the pomp and circumstance surrounded by the greatest athletes uh, of this day and in days gone by, at this ceremony he's given the opportunity to speak, sort of the spotlight. And here he is and he stands there as this uh, kid, as he refers to himself as as just a kid from uh, Athens, Ohio, where he grew up. And he stood up there, and rather than just necessarily bragging on himself and polishing the trophy and doing those kinds of things that sometimes you see athletes do, he almost teared up, and he broke up as he talked about through tears that he was standing there, not as some supreme athlete, but he says, I'm here standing up for all the kids in Athens and Athens County that go home to not a lot of food on the table hungry after school and then he added you know you guys if you try hard enough you can be up here too and after he had his acceptance speech a man in Athens County by the name of Will Drabold set up a fundraising site to raise money for the Athens County food pantry he was counting on Joe Burrow's words of compassion that caught everybody off guard to inspire other people and he was right Curious fans begin searching for information on Athens County, Ohio, which happens to be one of the poorest counties in the Appalachian area. And within two days, generous folks all around the country had donated $260,000 to the Athens County Food Pantry, all because they were moved by Burroughs' compassion for needy kids in his community that he grew up in. And it wasn't just a one-time deal. Uh, By the end of January of this year, 2020, $650,000 had been raised. And of course, during the COVID-19 that has been taking place, it has expanded to doing more than just simply food, but something that is being used to help meet the needs of those who were in a very difficult situation. And you see, this is the, the default that Jesus had. His default setting was compassion, the very core of Jesus' nature. It's the reason he gave up his power and authority as a part of the Godhead, became a human being and taking on all the weaknesses of human flesh and walked on this earth among us. Jesus' compassion for us is what led him to die on the cross. It was the only way to save us from our sins and restore that right relationship with God. You know, you walk into almost any Christian gathering in any corner of the world and you'll see a cross kind of like what we have here or in the baptistry behind me or on the steeple out there in front of the church. And why is that? Because as followers of Jesus Christ, the cross is the greatest symbol of compassion and love in all the world. 
Notice again the opening words of, of our, our gospel. When Jesus heard what had happened, he withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. What was he talking about? What had just happened in the life of Jesus? It certainly sets into context what took place. Jesus had just found out that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded by King Herod. It was such a horrible, horrendous thing to have it to happen to any great person like John the Baptist. But when you had a personal relationship with someone like that, it certainly uh, was a, a tragic event. And so Jesus naturally wanted to have some time alone to grieve his cousin's death. And he went out looking for that solitude. But the need of the crowds followed him even into this lonely place where he went to grieve. They're so desperate to hear his teaching, to receive his healing touch. They would have followed him anywhere to get what they need. Certainly you can imagine how Jesus could have easily maybe just gone a little deeper into the wilderness and turned his back, but we know that this is not Jesus' nature. When he looked out and saw the crowd of thousands, he didn't see a crowd. I heard a quote years ago that said, There's only one thing that God cannot do, and that is God cannot ever see a crowd. God always sees individuals and that's true with Jesus he didn't see a crowd of people a mob he saw individuals made in the image of God who were Im uh, immensely precious in God's sight he saw that these people were broken and hurting and he had compassion on the thousands that stood there before him And you know when we operate from a place of compassion we are seeing others as God sees them and when we see others as God sees them, we don't want to turn our head. We want to roll up our sleeves and we want to help. We want to be a part of the healing. We want to do whatever it takes because we know that we are valuable to God and that every, other, every person out there is valuable to God as well. And seeing the world as Jesus sees the world leads us to acts of compassion Often we have thoughts about compassion, but thinking about it really doesn't necessarily get much done. But seeing through the eyes of Jesus leads us to action, leads us to being involved with people, maybe giving up some of our own rights and comforts and possessions to meet the needs of those that are around us. We may feel like we don't really have that much of the world's resources to offer to really even make a dent in something that uh, uh, is such a huge problem. But if we feel and sense God leading us and having compassion, whatever we have offered to the Lord can be used in ways that we can't possibly even imagine. Back in the 13th century, a mystic by the name of Meister Eckhart wrote, You may call God love, you may call God goodness, but the best name for God is compassion. And certainly no one had more compassion than Jesus of Nazareth, who laid down his life for a sinful and hurting and dying humanity. Jesus is compassionate. But secondly, we see he's also competent. Uh, that's the second thing that's revealed in the story. He's totally, thoroughly capable. Whatever is taking place, uh, he's not caught off guard. He knows what's happening. He knows how to handle it, whether the needs be physical or emotional or spiritual. Uh, Christ is, is competent to use the power that he has. And this may be the point that many of us miss with the joy of our faith. We certainly believe that God cares about our need, but we don't necessarily go to that next step and believe that we can trust God to meet our needs. We don't really believe that he's truly able to completely help us. So oftentimes we're trapped in joyless and powerless lives. But what is good is compassion without the uh, competence to use it. We understand that Jesus is the one who is totally and thoroughly able. Orion Steen has a slogan emblazoned on the cover of the spare tire on the back of his Suburban. It reads this, I can't, God can, I'll let him. I can't, 
God can, I'll let him. The story behind that is that Orion had retired from the Honeywell Corporation where he was a successful manager. He was used to giving orders and being in control. Uh, and then one day the police came to his home and, address, and arrested his adopted son. Orion didn't know it, but his son was dealing drugs out of the family home. And for once in his life, Orion faced a situation where he couldn't call the shots. And you can imagine he was devastated. He went to his church and asked for help in dealing with this heartbreaking situation. And asking anyone for help was totally unfamiliar territory for Orion. But fortunately, there was a group of people in his church who had gone through a similar kind of pain in dealing with family members who were addicted to drugs or alcohol. And they met weekly to support one another. And through that group, Orion was able to make it through this situation. His son was sentenced to five years in jail, and Orion visited him every week that he could. But he couldn't seem to reach the boy with the seriousness of what he'd done. And after he was released, he returned again to selling drugs. And again, he was caught and arrested and sentenced to five years in jail. And again, Orion visited his son every week. But this time, the young man came around. In the midst of that second jail term, his son made a decision to allow Jesus to truly come into his heart and into his life. And Orion said, I had to learn the hard way that only God can change a person's life. Only God has the authority to forgive our sin and set us on a new path. That's why I have the slogan on the back of my car, I can't, God can, I'll let him. And I remember that every day, or at least I try to, that we have a God who not only cares about our needs, but is capable of meeting those needs at a deep level. And there's certainly one more thing that we need to see in this story, and that is the complicity of the young lad. He's not mentioned in this aspect, uh, this telling of, uh, of the uh, event of the feeding of the 5,000, but we know that there was a young lad that was there. And if he had not been willing, uh, when the disciples were walking around, seeing if anybody had any food, to kind of say, yeah, Mom packed me a lunch. I've got these, uh, l this little snack here in my pocket. And if he had not been willing to share his food, certainly Christ would have been able to found a way to feed the multitude. But it does seem to show us a clear principle of faith that Christ works best when he has something to work with. Maybe a couple of fish and some bread. Might be a, a tiny baby hidden in the bulrushes like God did with Moses. But it's obvious that God wants to have something to work with. And certainly you and I, as we live in this day and age, have been blessed by the advances in the world of medicine. Many diseases that plagued other generations are simply not even a threat to us. We don't even really realize what they were. And the uh, death rates for uh, common killers like cancer and heart attacks and strokes are continuing to decline. And people are living longer and longer. And, and this is one of those things that, that we are counting on to help us get through this COVID-19. That God would use those scientists and researchers to uh, help try and find a, a medical cure to what is taking place. Uh, making advances as quickly as we possibly can. But the cures that we enjoy uh, in our day and age have, have most likely been there as a part of nature. No one is creating something that is outside of, of what's already here, but it's because God has given us uh, a wisdom uh, through scientists and researchers to study those things in different combinations and different compounds that have been able to bring about what seems like miraculous cures would have been miraculous cures 200 years ago. And simply, uh, we take these things for uh, to uh, take them for granted. But even as we have been sort of knocked back uh, during the COVID-19 to realize how fragile human life is, how we can have uh, a, a full sense of health one moment and then struggle for life, in the next moment, it certainly brings us back to an understanding of, of humanity's plight that has been a part of, of uh, history for so many thousands of years before our day and age. 
but we understand that God is always the one who is uh, giving us the ability uh, if we will turn away from those things that occupy humanity uh, in every year, things like greed and lust and hatred and war, if we turn away from those things and look for places of healing, looking for things that we can do to help, to alleviate hunger, to alleviate those who are in, in need, to use our time and our talents in a positive way, God can use those moments to bring a blessing to our lives and to our world. And it is certainly a part of my prayers every day, as it is for so many Christians, that the Lord would lead us to a cure for what's taking place, not in our country, but literally around the world, to help us in the midst of this difficult, difficult situation. Paul talks about this in 2 Corinthians 5 when he wrote, All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That when we work and concentrate on being a part of God's solution, God can use what we do to bring reconciliation, to bring a, a, a bridge over the brokenness between us and God, to bring health and healing and wholeness to our world. And it is working with God, making this world that we live in a better place. It's not our only goal, but it is certainly a prime goal that God has for helping us as we seek to be faithful to his call upon our lives. We pray that God would be with those who need inspiration, uh, that, we would, that he would be with those who are studying to give them the, uh, the ability to persevere and that ultimately he would be able to show us a way out medically in the midst of all this. And yet, ultimately, we know that it is God's hand that blesses the medical, uh, the medical uh, cures that are there that brings about healing in our physical bodies. This amazing story shows us the compassion of Jesus, shows us his competence to meet our needs, but it also shows us in the example of a little boy with a sack of lunch in his pocket how God can use even the smallest gift to do something that is spectacular. Have you ever had that moment in your life where you had a need that you took it to Christ, that you put your hand in his and allowed him to help you through whatever situation you were going through? Look at the needs in your life and the lives of those around you. Do you or someone you know have a need? Offer to meet God with that need. Ask the Lord to lead you and guide you in how to deal with that situation. Make yourself a compliant part, allowing God to use you and your gifts and your talents and the things that you have passion for to be a part of God's healing process in this world. Certainly we know that as we put our hand in Christ's hand, he is the one who can lead us and guide us to be the people that he wants us to be. Certainly compassionate but yet those who are willingly compliant to follow his leadership in every area of our lives. Let's take a moment and go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful once again that even in the midst of the difficulties of life, we know that we have never been abandoned by you. And Lord, we pray that you would help us to be among those folks who are willing to be compliant, those who are willing to open themselves and, and, and give what you have entrusted to our care. Lord, maybe you want us to be more compassionate. Maybe you want us to be more uh, uh, believe more in your competence for meeting our need. And maybe, Lord, you simply looking for us to open our hands and turn loose of what we've got and allow you to use it in the building of your kingdom. Lord, as we stand before you this day, we pray that as you look at our lives, you would meet us at the point of our need and draw us to yourself through your Son. For it's in his name that we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is the hymn, Break Thou the Bread of Life, and we will sing just the first three verses of this hymn together.
Let us pray. Lord, as we go from this time of worship to the busyness of our lives, to those places of responsibility you have given us, we pray that we would go not in our power, but that we would go filled by your Holy Spirit, that we might be the light that you have called us to be as we follow you faithfully. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Thank you so much and go in peace. Thank you.